After a lifetime of researching the dynamic and enigmatic world of light entertainment, I've decided to ditch my notebook and meet the people who inspire me. What makes them the people they are? How do they feel about the show business landscape in which they find themselves? And in a world where anyone can be a star, is there still a need for performers who have universal appeal? Come with me on a journey of discovery as I get a unique insight into Britain's favourite stars with a little help from my glamorous assistants. Yeah, well, I say glamorous, more like hazardous. And of course, we'll have a bit of fun along the way. Television as a medium has come a long way in the last 60 years, and what was once considered a passing fad has now become entwined into the fabric of British life. Politicians and executives have slowly realised the significance that television has in capturing a mood of a specific time in modern British history. Scriptwriter turned television consultant Dick Fiddy spearheaded this campaign with his 1993 initiative Missing Believed Wiped which has been successful in rediscovering some of TV's lost gems. Now, in its 24th year, Missing Believed Wiped is as active as ever, and the BBC archive has been reunited with hours and hours of lost footage. I caught up with Missing Believed Wiped's main man to talk TV, the BFI, and life as a television consultant. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr Dick Fiddy. In 1993, you were responsible for creating a nationwide initiative entitled Missing Believe Wiped, which set about tracking down some of British television's lost moments. How did this concept come about? Well, it wasn't just me, <laughs> for a start. What, what happened is, um, a, few years, a couple of years previously, uh, the BFI had an initiative called Missing Believe Lost, which was trying to seek out some lost British films, many of them from the silent era. And they had, a, they, they had a search for a couple of years and they found, I suppose, out of a hundred, a list of a hundred films they put out there, they found something like two or three. And they made a big fuss of it. And whilst I was at that, um, I was at the press launch when they were talking about the ones they'd found, I was with some colleagues who worked here in, in the field of television and we thought, well, actually, if we did that for telev television, we were pretty sure we'd find quite a few more th things. It would be much more rewarding because just to the very nature of, of the way that television is made and who keeps what and the, the fact that things were sold abroad, the fact there might be more than one copy. So the following year, we launched this initiative called uh, Missing Believe White, which basically uh, started with a list of a hundred or a top 10 that we made available to the press of uh, the, the most important missing programmes. I mean, really, they, they were missing programme areas. So, for instance, we, we talked about a lot of the missing armchair theatres, but in, in the, really just to cover a lot of missing drama. We obviously looked at missing episodes of Doctor Who, because, but that was really just to cover um, missing episodes from any long-running series, which may have had a huge impact on people growing up who were saddened to learn that so much of it had been wiped. And uh, so, in your opinion, how important is the preservation of archive to Britain's popular culture? I think uh, television is, is is a really important mirror to the past. It's it's uh, it's quite informal and it reacts quite quickly to what's going on. I think you can you can tell more about the past by looking at a thirty second advert than you can sometimes by looking at a, a two hour film made at the same time. Um, I just think there's something about the aspirations of the people, the way they dress, the way they look, the way they walk, the way they talk, that actually tells you a lot about the past. And also it's one of those things, it's amazingly how quickly these things become historic. And uh, I think that was one of the things we learned. Of course, we do have a lot of old television, but every time you find a new bit, it's like finding another bit of the jigsaw. It, it helps you build a more complete picture of the time. Can you give us an insight of the excitement you, you have when you find a gem you thought was lost forever? I imagine it must be very re rewarding. There is palpable excitement when, when something's found, but you have, to, you have to look at the background to why the, how the, and why these things come back. Um, we were very conscious when we first started this that we wanted to get the BBC on board, but it was difficult for them because they had been responsible for wiping a lot of this stuff we were trying to find. They were worried about bad publicity. They were being accused of cultural vandalism. And the way that we got them on board was we described Missing Believe White as a treasure hunt, not a witch hunt. 
And I think that putting the emphasis on actually finding the gems rather than pointing the fingers at the people that wipe them was our key into getting the broadcasters on our side, especially the BBC. And so we've always emphasised that, you know, this, when the stuff comes back, it's like finding buried treasure. And there are, when some things come back, there is, you do get a thrill that you've managed to recover this. I'm, I remember when we first started, um, we were very, we got a great response because the article about what we were doing was actually run as, as a string, string of news piece across a lot of local newspapers. And then we were contacted by this woman whose husband used to collect films. And he said, well, he's got a lot of TV, telerecordings. And so a colleague from the archive and I went to see him. And sure enough, there were these things. And they were missing episodes, wonderful stuff. He had, um, he had a, a missing uh, comedy playhouse pilot with Terry Thomas in. He had a missing episode of at last 1948 show. He had stuff that was it was really exciting to us, and it was our very first find, the very first material that come back from the initiative. And that was once, we, and we were off and running. Then it meant that the following year we could screen the stuff that he had returned and other people had returned, and start an annual um, event screening all the material or some of the material that had been recovered in the previous year. And even now, when things turn up, there is, there is a real thrill. Excellent. And what's the most significant programme you've ever recovered? I think the most significant find has been the, the cachement of classic British dramas that were discovered in the Library of Congress about three, four years ago. What had happened was a, a Shakespeare scholar was doing work in the Congress, and, in the Library of, Cong uh, Library of Congress, and he realised that there were three or four TV Shakespeare's that he knew didn't survive in the UK because he'd done his research. So he alerted us to the fact that the Shakespeare's were in the Library of Congress. We have very, very good relationships with the Library of Congress, uh, in, in, especially with a guy called Mike Mashon, who's like our liaison there, liaison there. We got in touch with him and he ascertained that this missing material all come from something called... Um, Public Entertainment, uh, Public Education Television, um, part of the WNET, the forerunner of PBS, was, was the, the, and they took lots and lots from 57, 58 through to the end of the 60s. They took lots and lots of single plays. And um, when, when that um, collection was moved on, it was moved from place to place, eventually being lodged at the Library of Congress, where it hadn't really been catalogued or absorbed into the Library of Congress online catalogue. So it was very difficult to search it online, maybe an odd title, but not so much. And once this guy had alerted us that there was, some of these Shakespeare's were there, we asked Mike to send us a list of everything he had, and we found something like 100 hours worth, about 60 to 70 separate plays, um, some of which were extraordinary. And one, which, is, which was really wonderful was a Charles Crichton uh, filmed production of um, A Doll's House, Ibsen's A Doll's House, which was, uh, sorry, Well Duck, which was absolutely fantastic. It was, a it was in beautiful condition and, uh, it, and it's brilliantly done. So uh, with that collection as a whole, in that they had um, a Rudolf Cartier version of uh, The Life of Rembrandt and stuff like this, material that had been on the front page of the Radio Times. And as I say, about 60 titles. So that was, I think, the most significant find. The Battle of Godfrey's Cottage and Operation Kilt were two of the first episodes of Dad's Army to be recovered from the initiative. Now, how important was this in highlighting awareness of the campaign? Dad's Army is quite a, it, it, it's quite a unique case because um, the way that the BBC used to arrange wiping was they would go to the producers of a piece to announce that something they'd made some years earlier was now about to be wiped. But the producers of Dad's Army always declined. They always wanted to keep them, so they wouldn't let them be wiped. But apparently, I think it was, it was David Croft or Jimmy Perry was, um, was on holiday, and they, they couldn't get in touch with him, and they it, it ended up in the wiping of one series of Dad's Army, um, two of which, I think, were recovered elsewhere. Uh, three remained missing, and then we had this this great find and one of those weird ones. I, I th we can only surmise what happened, but what I think happened was this: that they um, they made a feature film version of Dad's Army, 
And uh, I think for continuity, so they knew what it looked like, I think the BBC lent them two episodes to look at so they could you know, make sure that the film looked like the series and they got the names right, the costumes right and, and stuff like that. And I think um, they kept those two films for a while and then uh, when the film was made, they dumped the films, I think, in a, in a skip. Someone that worked at the studio who was collected films and probably a bit of a collector took them home, kept them in his shed. And then when he died, his daughter was clearing out the shed. She found these things. They had BBC labels on them and she contacted the BBC and that's how they came back. So, I mean, it's significant. It's significant finds, obviously, there's a financial... Um, value to, the, to them. A lot of the stuff we get back, there's very, very little financial value. It's a cultural value, very little financial value. But if you get a Dad's Army or a Doctor Who, you know that's going to go out on DVD, it's going to be downloaded, it's going to be repeated. So they, do, they are quite significant finds, yeah. Reflecting upon the entire Missing Believe White campaign, has it fulfilled your expectations of what you originally set out to achieve? Oh, it's far outweighed our expectations. It's been... You, if you'd have told me 25 years ago that we'd still be finding enough stuff to do two, two and a half hour sessions every year of material come back and that the competition to get a title within those two screenings was, was huge, I'd have been amazed. Um, I think, of course, the, the, the biggest single um, uh, boost to it has been the internet because it's very easy now to have a global search, to ask people globally and to find... And people download things on YouTube which you know are not in the archives, so you know they've got them somewhere. Very often they don't know they're missing. They've just got, because they were a fan of Slade, they've got a, a three minutes of Slade on a missing top of the pot, which gives you a clue that this stuff's out here. So the internet has been the driving force these days of what brings material back. As a television historian... What impact did the closure of BBC Television Centre in 2013 have on the preservation of programme making? I don't know what impact it'll have on the preservation of, of, of programmes because obviously we're in a digital age now, it's much easier to keep material, plus we're more aware of the value of, of old television. When the, the material we're talking about, when it was junked or white, it had no commercial value. We didn't have a... We didn't, have a culture of, uh, of retro um, television. We had repeats, but repeats just really meant screening something that had, that had shown the previous year. We didn't really have this, this nostalgic quote. We didn't have whole channels dedicated to old TV. We didn't have DVDs and downloads out there. So there was no, no use for the old television. Usually it had run out of contract and copyright. Um, it was black and white at a time when television had turned colour. So. And there were sound financial reasons for getting rid of stuff because you could use the tapes again. So the technology worked against actually keeping the material. I, I always say that, you know, you can imagine how the BBC would have been um, terribly uh, attacked by the Daily Mail and the Daily Express if they'd have found out that, you know, they were sitting on 10,000 videotapes full of useless television programmes that couldn't be shown again. Uh, rather, and we were buying new tapes rather than reusing the old ones. So it, it made good, sound financial sense, good housekeeping to, to reuse those tapes. It's only in retrospect, but now we, we see that it it, 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 it's what we consider cultural vandalism. And, but even now, things are going missing. But I don't think the actual closure of TV centre um, had much to do with that. I think probably more serious about the closing of the centre is, is the actual nature of, of how the centre helped programme makers. Because the way it worked is, is you had a bar and people went to the bar and they went from all different departments and they mixed and talked together and you knew what was happening and what was coming up. And very often, it was quite informal, um, you know, someone from the drama department would introduce a writer to someone from the comedy department and they would talk about an idea and then an actor would wander in and they'd go, oh, well, what are you doing next week? Would you come and read this for us? And so it was just that informality and pushing people together. It happened at Granada. I think it happened at the BBC. TV Centre was, was absolutely brilliant for that. It was, it was, it was a great um, sort of melting pot of ideas. A lot of it fueled by alcohol, it must be said, but it did work. And, you know, things were run simply. And having everything in one place like that, almost like a factory, but a very, you know, a very bespoke factory, 
just just as good. And I think that's more important. The, the television is becoming polarized and isolated, and you, you you don't get that sort of camaraderie anymore creating programs. Now, your work at the BFI brings you into contact with a whole host of famous faces from the world of entertainment. Did you ever see yourself as an interviewer? No, um, my, my very first interviews I did here were um, we did an exhibition about pop video, and I interviewed over the course of six weeks, once a week for six weeks, um, people that had directed pop videos. And I was quite nervous. I can remember being quite nervous. They were, they were in a small cinema, but I wasn't used to public speaking. But it turned out that these guys were far more nervous, these pop video directors, that it was the first time anyone had spoken to them. And they, even though they were in charge of immense budgets and that, they were terrified. It was like a rabbit in the headlights having them on stage. And I remember that sort of put me at ease because I sort of thought, wow, well, actually, they're nervous as well. One of us has to, has to sort of be calm here and take control. And I, it was just within those six weeks, I just got used to it. And because nothing terrible happened and because people mostly... I mean, we, we try and, and give them an easy ride. I mean, this is not the Spanish Inquisition. You know, we're asking them questions about their career. In an age when the BBC Charter is constantly under threat, in what way does television continue to serve a purpose to the viewing public? Well, the viewing public make their mind up about the television they want. So when people complain that the schedules today are full of reality programmes and soap operas, it reflects, in a way, what the public want. It does seem to me that, for some reason, there is less variety on TV now rather than more variety, despite the fact there's more channels, and I think that's something that needs to be addressed. Uh, but television has got a firm place, and even though the traditional idea of television of the box in the corner that the family gather around, that's gone now. We're in a different age of television where... The lines between film and TV are, are, are getting blurred. The lines between the internet and television are getting blurred. We call it tele television at the moment, but what is it really? It's a new hybrid in, in which television, the old television, is just part of. But it's the same with film. I mean, they don't use film anymore, but they still call it film. You know, so, so you know, it's it, it's un, it, it's undergoing a change as the te technology has driven a huge change which does have an impact on the social structure of television and the way people absorb it. And I think it's a bit that that's happened too recently, really, to take a step back and look at how it's affected things. You have to wait a few years for that. Now, the BFI arranges screenings of cult TV shows and documentaries. To what extent are you attempting to educate an audience as well as entertain them? Well, it's not just cult. Although there's a lot of cult television within there, and that word itself is, is a strange word now. I, I went to a, um, something that was described as a cold television convention. When I went there, they had every type of television, from the weather report to sci-fi. And I thought, well, if that's all cult, until I realised that what they meant by cult was the actual the people that went to the convention who, was, who were obsessively interested in television. So they were the cult not the television programmes themselves. So we do, we, we show everything from the broad spectrum of television. Some things, it has to be said, um, do less well here than others. Bizarrely, soap opera has always been a struggle for us to sell. You know, I mean, perhaps the very first few years of Coronation Street do well, but almost anything else, it doesn't have the same impact as music programmes, as drama, as comedy, or, or as documentary. So... Um, but we, do, we still do show them. Um, I think, yes, part of the way we're, out, we're able to show television here is because we have an arrangement with the triumvirate of the craft unions, with Equity, the Writers Guild and the MU, which allows us 150 screenings a year here, uh, of which we don't have to have clearances, uh, and we pay a certain amount of money into their joint pension fund. But part of that arrangement is that they see these screenings as... Well, educational is part of the arrangement, but in many ways it's like the, the Rethian idea to educate, illuminate and entertain. So it's all, all three of those things, you know. So yes, there is certainly um, a strand of education. And this is one of the few places where you can see so much old television. You'll get the occasional repeat of something on, on, on and you'll get the occasional DVD release. But really, if you look at the, the 
the financial use of the archive, it's like the tip of the iceberg. They're using the things that they can they can make big money on and can show again and again. When you deep de- when you dive down, you'll see that there's sort of all sorts of bizarre stuff that never gets shown anywhere else but here. Where do you see the future of the BFI? Well, the BFI are the big plans in in motion at the moment. Um, the South Bank itself will be moving to a huge new film centre. We, we seem to have half the money up and running already. We're, we're looking for the other half. Uh, there's a big initiative called BFI 2022, which seeks to um, use lottery money to try and digitise another great tranche of the archive. The, the archive itself is, is the centrepiece of the BFI. It's the most important part of it. And it's... It's been neglected just because of cash, the lack of cash flow over the years. So it's, it's now become imperative that we do something about the two inches, that we do something about the ancient films, the tele recordings. So where, the, where TV is concerned at the BFI, I think it's going to be a very exciting time over the next five or six years. The BFI itself, though, like all cultural organisations, is cash strapped. It needs help. It needs to have more partnerships with the commercial wings of different organisations. So anyone can tell what's that happened these the last few years haven't been an easy ride if you're in charge of organizations like this but at the moment it's surviving okay and finally what's next for dick fiddy well all my time at the moment is taken up organizing this um help to organize this radio times bfi festival which is on in in april which is 40 events over a weekend which is a tremendous amount of concentration when that's finished, um, there are ongoing things. We work about a year ahead, so I know what we're roughly what we're doing. Um, I'm doing some work at the moment and thinking that next December I might do um, a season of pantomimes on TV. Uh, there's some good stuff from the 60s and 70s that feature people that aren't in jail, so I think we could be, uh, we could be okay with that. Excellent. Thanks very much for your time today, Dick. That's brilliant. <laughs> Thank you very much to our guest for being the subject of another Beyond the Title interview. If you like this, why not browse the website and see if there's anything else that takes your fancy. Don't forget to like our Facebook page to receive updates on forthcoming interviews and to see more information about me and what I do. Thanks again and hopefully see you next time for another Beyond the Title interview.